Uh, dear students, I welcome you to my video lectures. I am your course instructor, Dr. Mazullah Khan. Uh, today, I will talk about part of uh, chapter number 15, which is, in my opinion, one of the most important uh, topics in this, chap uh, in this book. Uh, we have covered most of the contents, and chapter number 15 will be the last chapter that we'll be covering from this book. Uh, for the remainder, I will uh, give you different uh, articles and uh, in those topics we will cover actually about uh, Islamic uh, modes of financing. So in this chapter which is required returns and the cost of capital we will talk about value creation and we will also talk about overall cost of the firm in some books it's called WAC, which is Weighted Average Cost of Capital. And then we will talk about project specific uh, required returns and growth specific required rates and then total risk evaluation. So there are some key sources of value creation. In last chapter, as, you, as if you remember, if the NPV of a certain project is greater than zero or the IRR is greater than the required return or profitability index suppose it's more than one, those projects actually create what they call excess returns. And those excess returns are also called uh, value creation. So suppose if the NPV of a project is two million dollars, in other words, that project is adding two million dollars uh, for the shareholders. But the most important question here is that what are the key sources of value creation? So there are two sources of value creation one is industry attractiveness and the other one is competitive advantage within the industry in attractiveness there are some industry specific factors and let's say if your company is operating within that industry it's a competitive uh, advantage uh, for you uh, so industry attractiveness for example growth phase of a product life cycle uh, in early 2000 in Pakistan, when I was almost your age, uh, there was a boom in telecommunication uh, sector. So uh, mobile phones were like very new to the market and they were actually uh, marketing those products on mass uh, scale. Uh, so for example, if you're a company uh, which is operating within telecommunication industry, uh, that specific industry attractiveness was a very uh, big source of value creation uh, for your shareholders. I'll give you another example from local economy. Suppose uh, the current government prime minister promised that they will uh, build uh, 5 million houses. Uh, it may be a political slogan but let's say if it really materializes so any company which is operating in the construction industry, they will see uh, a growth. Uh, they will see actually a significant growth. There are some barriers for entry in certain industries. And those barriers to entries, they may be actually, for example, let's say uh, uh, in, in Pakistan, if you remember, there were some tax incentives for uh, all those industries operating actually in uh, Gadun Amazi. Uh, so let's say special tax uh, benefits, it may be a barrier for competitive entry. So the existing companies, they are eligible for tax uh, incentives and let's say the new entrants, they are not. So the existing companies actually, they have a competitive advantage or the new entrants. Uh, the other barrier that uh, I can think of are actually the patents. So 
most R&D companies, uh, whenever they develop something, for example, any vaccine or anything, uh, they uh, patent uh, those uh, uh, their, uh, their research. Uh, so nobody else can actually copy their product. So that's another uh, barrier to competitive entry. So barriers to competitive entry, if they are on the higher side, it's actually adds uh, value to a company. Uh, so this patent actually is essentially a barrier to competitive entry. So I would put it here, uh, but the book actually mentions it here it, uh, in the other category. There are some market structures. For example, let's say if, if you are a monopoly uh, and the monopolistic business that I can think of in Pakistan is actually the uh, utility companies. Uh, so we have only uh, Wabda and there are distribution companies like ISCO, PISCO uh, and uh, some other companies. Uh, but the main generating company is only one. Other ones are actually very small. So the competition in utilities in Pakistan, they are very, very monopolistic. One of the key resource, uh, sources of value creation, as I said, they come from competitive advantage. So whenever I talk about competitive advantage, it means that it's an advantage within the industry. Industry attractiveness was attractiveness of an industry among the industries. But here, competitive advantage is actually advantage of a company uh, within the industry. It may be cost. So for example, if a certain company uh, is producing their product um, very cost efficiently, uh, although the competition ensures that the price difference uh, between two similar products uh, is not that huge, uh, but even then there is a price uh, advantage for some company, cost advantage for some companies. So if the cost is low, if the cost is low, of course, they can either price it low or even for similar price. So if they price it low, of course they have advantage, price advantage. Uh, but let's say if they keep the price same, then of course their profit margin is more. Profit margin is more. And then they can make more money compared to uh, the other competitors. The other sources of value creation within the competitive advantage is actually marketing and uh, pricing. So marketing, uh, for example, good uh, advertisements sometimes they create uh, a very strong brand identity. Uh, I can remember from my MBA project, uh, in those days, Pepsi was trying to introduce their product to Pakistan uh, and they were marketing their product very, very aggressively. Coca-Cola, on the other hand, was losing its market share uh, big time. Uh, so we did a project and actually we did an experiment. Uh, we did an experiment with different students where we uh, actually served Coca-Cola and Pepsi in plan, uh, uh, plan uh, glasses, plan cups. So from the color, they cannot tell. And with the taste, we would ask the, quest uh, the questions that, okay, uh, which one did you like? And they would pick something. and. Uh, we would say, okay, why did you like it? And they would say, okay, the, the, for example, let's say the taste is very strong. Some people thought that it has like uh, more uh, of a uh, fizz compared to other any, uh, like for example, compared to any other uh, carbonated uh, drinks. So the last question we would ask that, okay, the thing that you really liked what do you think? Is it Coca-Cola or is it Pepsi? Uh, and they would uh, think that it was Pepsi. Uh, but as some of the students, actually a large number of students were wrong. Uh, it was not the taste. So the result was, it was not the taste of Pepsi or it was not actually some characteristics or attributes of uh, Pepsi. 
it was actually the brand image that they created through their advertisement. So sometimes effective marketing and advertisement strategies, they give you a competitive advantage or other competitors. Uh, perceived quality. So for example, if I ask you a question about uh, Apple, what do you think about their product? Most of the people think that Apple Max is a very strong product. It's very durable. So perception, your perception is your reality. My perception is my reality. So perception are actually influenced through marketing and advertisement strategies. Uh, but creating a strong perception about a brand, it is a competitive advantage. As I said, Apple, they created uh, they created a very, very good uh, image for their product uh, that they make uh, very reliable hardware uh, and uh, their hardware is very superior to compared to other uh, competition. And superior organizational uh, capability. So sometimes the organization from within, uh, they have superior organizational capability in terms of their talent. Uh, so for example, uh, I will give you an example of uh, Elon Musk who is a tech entrepreneur and he is also a co-founder of Tesla. So Tesla, uh, I can tell you that in North America, Canada and uh, uh, USA, there is no competition for them. Uh, they are by far leading the uh, full electric uh, cars, full electric vehicles market. So sometimes within the organization, another example would be, let's say, uh, airline manufacturing companies. Uh, there are hardly any in the world. Uh, the most famous ones are Boeing, and uh, the other one is uh, Airbus. Other than that, there are some small competitors, uh, but the main competitor is uh, Airbus and Boeing. So sometimes superior organizational capability in terms of its talent, in, in, in terms of its resources, it gives a huge competitive advantage or, uh, or others. Uh, the other example I can think of is actually, let's say, Microsoft. Microsoft is a leading producer of operating systems. The other ones are, for example, uh, Apple has their own uh, Mac, um, and uh, there is like Linux and some other operating systems. But the most widely used ones is, of course, uh, Microsoft ones. So the whole point is that organizational capability in terms of its talent and in terms of its resources, it gives a competitive advantage to a company. So through these industry attractiveness and competitive advantages, companies create value. And the way it's, that value creation is actually shown in higher NPVs and higher uh, internal rate of returns and similarly higher profitability index. So if the NPV, I will repeat, it's more than zero, of course, that extra uh, uh, extra uh, value of the project goes to uh, shareholders uh, in, uh, like as an excess uh, return and uh, it increases actually the value of uh, shareholders. So if the NPV as I said earlier is two million dollars that two million dollars adds value to the shareholders wealth. So overall cost of capital, this is a very, very important uh, topic. And as I said, in industry, weighted average cost of capital is also widely used terminology for overall cost of capital. This one, WAC, which is weighted average cost of capital, this one actually tells you the whole story. So it's, it's a weighted and it's average cost of capital. So cost of capital is the required rate of return on various types of financing. I'll show you in my next slides that all companies, they have different sources of financing. Uh, like for example, uh, 
they, they, they generate financing through bonds, they generated finances through preferred stock, through common stock, and there are some other sources available as well. So what is the overall cost of capital? Of course, you have to calculate individual cost of uh, financing and then you have to uh, adjust it for uh, weight, which means that you have to apply weights to those, uh, to those uh, percentages. The overall cost of capital is the weighted average of individual required rates of return. So, if I give you an example, I borrowed this example from the book. Suppose you borrow $2,000 from a friend, from one friend and then $3,000 from another friend. And then what you do, you also contribute $5,000 and then you create a fund of $10,000. What you can do, you can invest that money in a project. And for example, the investor's return, which is the required rate of return. So your first friend thinks that, okay, if he or she gets 5% return, she's happy. Uh, but let's say your other friend thinks uh, that he or she needs only 10% and you require actually 15% uh, required rate of return. So this required of rate of return is different for all individuals. Of course, it depends on the project as well, project risk, but it also depends on the risk taking uh, ability or let's say the risk taking appetite of that individual. So if I calculate the proportion of their financing, so the first friend contributed 20%, the second friend contributed 30%, and the remaining 50%, you contributed that money. So the weighted cost is 1% for first, for the second it's 3%, and for, uh, for you it's actually 7.5%. And the way you calculate it, actually, you multiply column number 2, which is this number, with column number 3, which is this number. Okay. So the dollar annual cost for the investor. So investor, if he gets $100, so based on 5% return, actually, he or she needs $100 in a year. Based on $3,000 investment, your second friend needs $300 return. And you, since you contributed $5,000 and you require 15% return, your total required return is 750 per year. So the total return that is needed is 1150. In terms of percentages, 1150 divided by 10,000 or the vetted cost is 11.5%. So what WEG actually does, WEG gives you a single return and if you earn that return, the expectation of all individuals are satisfied. In other words, if the project return is 11.5%, individual, individual number one will get a return according to his or her expectation. Individual number two will get a return according to his or her expectation. And you will also get a return according to your expectation. So 11.5% eleven point five percent is actually a combined return of all these three individuals including yourself so WEG what it does it gives you single single rate because what we can what the book says that you can think of a company as so you can think of a company as a series of projects. So although it's, it's a single company, for example, any pharmaceutical company, let's say Abbott, right? So let's say it's, it's a single company, but they have a series of different products. So you can think of that company as a series of different projects. Now individual projects has individual risk. So one project may be more risky compared to other projects. For example, these days due to coronavirus, 
different companies are trying to uh, create a vaccine, to develop vaccine for coronavirus. Now those companies have some other products as well. Now development of that vaccine is a very, very risky project. They may succeed or they may not succeed. So of course, the project risk of that particular vaccine, like coronavirus vaccine, is high compared to uh, other, let's say, uh, medicines or let's say vaccine that already they developed it. So since company, we can think of that company as a series of different projects. So company, all projects, we can assign different risks to that company. And of course, if the risks are different, then the required rate of return is also different. Because for high risk projects, you need higher returns. Now, in order to evaluate the value of that company, it will be very, very difficult because we have multiple uh, required rates. Because why multiple? Because we can think of a company as a series of multiple projects. So, company. So, let me let me write it uh, for you so that we remember. So, valuation of a company depends on. So it's a function of, it means that it depends on multiple discount rates. So discount rates. So discount rate here is required rate of, uh, required rate of return. So valuation of a company depends on multiple rates of return. Why multiple? Because we can think of a company as a series of multiple projects and then individual projects have different risks. Since they have different risks, of course, the required rate will be also different. Now, what WEG does, which is the weighted average cost of capital, it transforms all multiple rates into a single rate. And then you can simply apply one rate. And by applying that one rate, it actually satisfies the expectations of all investors. So that's the beauty of WAC. Okay, so market value of long-term financing. So, for example, on the balance sheet, if I may show you on, on the next slide and then I'll come back here. So this is a typical balance sheet. This is asset side and this is liability side. On the liability side, as you can see, there are accounts payable and there are some other accruals, spontaneous debt, total is like accounts payable and accruals, and then we have note payables, and then we have long-term debt, preferred stock, and then we have common stock and retained earnings. So not all liabilities are actually from investors. So investors are those individuals who lend you money or who, let's say, invest in your company uh, and they expect a return. So account payables, for example, those individuals, those are like trade creditors. They supply you, uh, let's say, raw material uh, on credit. They do not expect any compensation for that. It means that that particular loan is free. You do not pay anything extra for that. So the actual sub investor supply capital is actually your notes payable which is 110 and then the long-term debt of course those are like bonds uh, so you pay uh, you pay interest on on that or coupons and then you have preferred stock so let's say here in this particular example preferred stock is zero but let's say if it was like 50 of course you include preferred stock because preferred stock comes with a component where you need to pay them uh, periodically. Uh, so again, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a mode of mode mode of long term debt where you need to pay the investor. And common stock, of course, those individuals expect uh, uh, dividends and uh, of course uh, other uh, returns in future. So the whole point of this slide that all liabilities do not qualify for investor supplied capital. Only those loans 
are eligible, uh, which carries a particular interest rate or uh, which has a cost. Accounts payable do not have any cost, so that's why we excluded it. So let me go back to the first slide. So whenever we talk about long-term financing, we talk about long-term debt, we talk about preferred stocks, and then we talk about common stock equity as well. So, so suppose a company, this is a very, very simple example. They have $35 million long-term debt, and they have $15 million in preferred stock, and then they have $50 million in uh, common stock equity. And suppose these are the weights. So we can easily actually calculate those weights. So 35 divided by 100 is 35%, similarly to 15 and 50%. Now, what is the overall cost of capital? Of course, we have to first of all individually identify, for example, cost of debt, then cost of preferred stock, and then cost of common stock. And then we can apply those strategies and we can calculate the overall cost of capital or, in other words, a weighted average cost of capital. So the first component, as you can see, it's the long-term debt. In today's lecture, I will only talk about the cost of long-term debt, that how do we calculate it. It's very, very straightforward. So for cost of debt, of course, it's the required rate of return on investment of the lenders of a company. So this is actually, P0 is actually the price of the debt and how Sorry, the, the, for example, let's say if you're buying, um, let's say a bond. So this is price of the bond. And then what, what it really does, it takes into account the entrance component of that uh, particular security and the, the, the price that you get at the maturity. And then, of course, you have to discount it. And the discount rate that you're using is actually KD. So KD is actually my discount rate. For bonds, it's also called yield to maturity. And I can easily calculate KD. And once I calculate it, then I can calculate KI, which is the after-tax cost of debt. And why after-tax? Because debt is tax deductible. So that's why we take out the effect of tax. So suppose if the marginal rate of tax is, let's say, 30%, so I will include 1 minus 0 0.3. I'll give you an example. So calculating cost of debt is not that uh, difficult. It's, it's super simple. So for example, Basket Funders has $10,000 par value zero coupon bond outstanding. Basket Wonder bonds are currently trading at 385.54 with 10 years to maturity. Basket Wonder's tax bracket is 40%. So as you can remember from chapter number 4, I can use this expression and calculate actually this KD, which is in chapter number 4 we call it yield to maturity or YTM okay so since it's a zero coupon bond there is no interest payment involved so that's why it's zero plus after 10 years at the maturity I'm getting $1,000 so if I draw a timeline for you so zero one, two, and then 10, okay? So 385.45, sorry, five, okay, sorry. Let me, so this is 385.54. So this bond is currently, currently means that at time zero, it's trading at 385.54. From trading means that the current price of the bond is 385.54. And after 10 years, you are getting 
$1,000. So if I discount $10,000 for a certain rate, so my task is actually to calculate this KD, the required rate of return, uh, which is due to maturity in this case. Uh, it's 385. So let me work out. So simple algebra. So once you solve the whole equation for KD, the rate is actually 10%. So KD is 10%. But you do not have to stop here. This is yes, this is a YTM. But for calculating cost of debt, you have to make adjustment for tax always. So do not forget. Remember. Okay. Do not forget to make an adjustment for tax. As the question suggests that the marginal rate, tax rate for uh, basket funders is 40%. Of course, this marginal tax depends on your uh, income bracket. So if you are making more money in North America, you pay more taxes. But let's say if you are making less money, then you, make, uh, you pay less uh, taxes. So it's a progressive taxation. So here the tax rate is 40%. And once I do that adjustment, uh, it's, I think, 6%. Okay. I'll stop here. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, please send me email at mozilla at gt.edu.pk or send me a question through WhatsApp group. Today we covered only cost of uh, debt, and it's uh, super easy. Uh, on the balance sheet, of course, we have different uh, different uh, debts actually, even like for example, short term debt, and then we have long term debt as well. So, my first task is actually to calculate the VATs and then individual cost of debt, and then I have to, uh, I mean, apply the the the, the VAT here. To calculate average uh, cost of debt so that's another level so let's say if you have multiple debts you can apply different rates and then can arrive at a single rate so that's not a problem so I thank you very much for your attention and as I said if you have any questions send me an email I'll see you in my next lecture have a wonderful day